Uh, what I would like to try to do this morning is communicate to you the general conception that underlies the Dialogue House program, the conception of man that it's based on, and the way we have developed techniques and programs over the past few years. Actually, in one way of saying it, my own feeling is that this is an attempt to work out a full and integrated program that would make it possible to take a transpersonal conception of man out into modern society and provide it uh, to various organizations as a tool with which people can work. I would like to put, say something about the origins or the style of development because there is perhaps something symbolic in the great law with which we started in that the sources and the development of this point of view come out of what is almost a non-psychological way of looking at man. If I put it back into my own development, which would take it back about 25 years or so, where it begins essentially in the field of social philosophy and so sociology, but more social philosophy and social history, where my concern was, I guess I had perceived what Jung saw from a social point of view, namely that the problem of modern man is a lack of an experience of meaning, and that somehow that has to be reached into and provided. And that meant that it was really not adequate to work with the psychological tools that were available in the 40s and even in the 50s, that the sense that an experience of meaning was somehow essential for achieving personal therapy was really far out of range and was rather ridiculed. And it meant that having to determine that that was the way to see the question, that I had to work through, as it was at that time, Jung's work and the various Eastern philosophies in order to find materials that would make it possible to deal with the person from what can be called a depth point of view. And one can speak of depth or one may speak of height, but essentially what is involved is a sense of the largeness of the human person. And especially this, as it has come to us now, to see that really what is involved in the unconscious is not so much the part of the psyche that has been repressed, that is, the unconscious is not so much our past experience, as that the unconscious is just that part of a human being that has not yet been experienced. It's that part that has not yet been lived. Just as in the metaphor that we use, it's as though the acorn contains in its unconscious the oak tree. And if the acorn had a dream, it would be a dream that would express the coming into being of the oak tree or any of the stages by which that development would take place. Now that means really that, that what we have to do in a working with a person, if it's psychological work, is we have to have a method of drawing forth what is in the seed, what is in the still unlived potentials of the person. That's why I've spoken of a, a psyche evoking rather than a psychoanalysis. And that led, that led me to the need of having a method or procedure by which one could actually do this evoking, considering that the development of a person is not just a limited development. I mean in the seed, if you take that metaphor in nature, that the seed of any species has the possibility of development up to a certain point. I mean, a, the tulip bulb can grow, if it grows well, it can grow into a tulip. And every species in nature has that possibility. But then one comes to this realization that the human being is different from all other species in nature in that the development of the human being is not somehow fixed in its limits. But, and that as a matter of fact, it seems that the one thing that is inherent in the development of the human being in the nature of man is that if his development follows what could be called a normal pattern, then it will reach a point where the automatic or the built-in pattern of development, if it reaches its full development, 
it will then come to a point where a subjective experience is necessary as the next step in the growth of the person and in the fulfillment of his being a human being. In other words, all the other species have a more or less objective pattern of development that could be described as their growth. But the characteristic of the human being is that if he comes to a certain point, which would be in late adolescence primarily, he comes to a place where his physiological development and the basic capacities of learning and all these things that are in developmental psychology courses, all that is done and has reached the objective point. And then it becomes essential if he's going to be a human being, that he has an experience which by its nature is a subjective experience, that is to say nobody can force it or make it happen. It has to happen of itself from the inside, and that's, that's what makes it so elusive, that it only can come into being in a subjective way. And so that became, for me, the focus of the work. How could I make it possible for that subjective experience to take place in a modern person? And that's really the way that the problem came to me and the answer to it in the last several years has been this program of Dialogue House, which I'd like to try to communicate. See, in looking for models, the basic model is the experience of initiation that you see in primitive cultures, where the old self dies, the childhood self, and in a ritual that the culture provides, the person is taken over to the next part of his life. Now that's a subjective experience, but it has this characteristic. It's a subjective experience that is brought and made possible by the rituals that which the society gives. And it depends on a particular structure of traditions. And wherever a culture has those traditions, the traditions provide a ritual for rebirth, that is for death and rebirth and the initiation to mature life. But if you come to a culture where the traditions have broken down, then you have an altogether different problem. And that has seemed to me to be the characteristic situation of the modern world, which even transcends Eastern civilization or Western civilization. Because I think we could see that inherently the methodology, or it has seemed to me in working with Eastern methodologies, that the Eastern methodologies, like any of the methodologies, for example, in Christian contemplation or the uh, techniques in Kabbalah and Hasidism and Judaism or Sufism, that all these techniques, which are essentially techniques for spiritual initiation on various levels, all of them derive from particular cultures and therefore from particular contexts of tradition. They move within the context of tradition that brought them forth. And persons can work with them, you see, within that framework. But the situation of the modern person, and I think this is true whether he's in Eastern civilization or in Western civilization, the situation of the modern person is actually that what makes him a modern person is that he is living in a framework where the old traditions of any kind do not have a self-evident meaning to him. If they are going to have a meaning to him, for the modern person, it can only be that he re-experiences it. That is, he, that he be in the situation of the person, as it's said that, you know, in the saying, blessed is he who believes in God. But doubly blessed is he who has believed in God, who has lost his faith, and has had it restored to him. Now the important part of that second experience is that whatever the nature of the new belief that you get, it has, it's yours. And therefore, in a certain sense, the fact that modern society has lost its contact with the old tradition is not only a crisis and a source of pain and disturbance, but is also its great opportunity because it means that we really have a situation from which we can be reborn. That is to say that historically, death has happened for modern man. And therefore, he is in a position where an authentically grounded rebirth can take place. And so the question is a methodology and a way. Now, it has seemed to me that another characteristic of modern man
that makes it different from the primitive situation of initiation is that in primitive times the life expectancy of a person is roughly 30 or 40 years that means that if a person goes through the initiation cycle and is taken over into mature life let's say to be a hunter or a warrior or to be the woman who raises the children or does the farming or whatever he goes through that initiation he really has the possibility of just living one cycle of life and then that's it and a rare person might go through a further initiation and be a shaman or medicine man or, or something like that but in our time a person would go through the initiation or would reach mature life and with our life expectancy and it's one of the phenomena that we see in the modern world a person actually has the possibility of living two or three life images in a sense living two or three lifetimes and each time he lives that that is to say each time a person lives out a an image and a phase of existence it is as though that self that he is dies and he may go through then a period you see when the old image is dying let's say that a man becomes a businessman or has a profession and pushes himself into it and there's all the energy moving out to the work and then it comes to the time when the work is done or the interest in it lags and then he finds that the the pull of his inner energy into the outer work starts to wane and then his feelings are feelings of confusion and disorientation and he goes through a time maybe of depression or anxiety and it kind of becomes a period of vacuum through which he has to pass until another set of imagery another feeling of life expression becomes available and then it requires again an inner experience that will validate this and give him what the primitive initiation provides namely the two things of an experience of his identity in relation to the world as a whole and a sense of something specific that he can do in his life that is it takes him into the the world myth whatever the tribe's myth is and it gives him a specific work now the problem of the modern man is that since the tradition since it's not a traditional society anymore but a secular culture the modern person has to find his relation to the universe as a whole out of his own individual experience and it's only words if it's only something that is told to him it has to be something that he actually experiences in the reality of his life and in order for him really to experience it it must be as it seems not to be only the kind of objective experience that is a one-time phenomenon but it must be something that actually gets deeply enough into his life that he can live it day to day so that it has seemed to me in this in working out this format that the any program that would look toward making it possible for a modern person to have an experience and a framework in his life that could be called in some sense meaningful or spiritual would have to be a program that assumes the conditions with which the modern secular person begins in other words it's not adequate to come and say to a person if you believe this or this then you will have an experience of meaning because it may be that he cannot in fact it probably is that the reason modern man is in his state that he is is that he cannot he cannot start with any fixed set of beliefs therefore there has to be a program that can start where the person is wherever he is in his life and give him a means of working with that within his own frame of reference until he reaches an experience that involves that essential core of death and rebirth which seems to be the basic initiation experience of every culture that you look at but the difference is that that basic social experience that unit of death and rebirth in our time has to be experienced each time anew and in each person's life within its own framework and within its own context.